today I am here to convince you that the billion dollar drag industry should unionize. I've been doing drag since college in one capacity or another. A lot of Britney Spears impressions. And that combined with the months of research that I have done for this video means that I'm ready to speak to you on this topic from a place of both personal experience and journalistic expertise. And while I know that the title of this video is going to have people already reacting, please do me the professional courtesy of sticking around to hear me out, and I promise that I will make you at least reconsider. You could even just leave me on in the background while you do your makeup. I have seen the seven hour TikTok live streams that you people do while you paint your faces, so. Laura, please help deliver these two from this life of sin. I think we both know the target audience for this video has the time. So unions, I actually co-founded a union for writers at the last media company that I was at. So I have some experience explaining all of this. Serena said she went to art school. She might want her money back. I dropped out of college with three credits left. Why am I telling you that? There are a lot of misconceptions about unions being spread around right now by some bad actors, but a union is just a legally recognized group of people who all have similar jobs that have decided to negotiate as a group with the people that hire them so that they can get more money or better working conditions. That's all a union is. Actors have unions and musicians have unions and writers have unions and plumbers have unions and taxi drivers have unions. Even the police have unions. Um, but because the people in that union can legally shoot you or take your stuff, uh, those are not the same kind. Police unions are different and a lot more racist. So I think like a really good way to understand unions is if you remember the plot of A Bug's Life, which if you do, hi old, if you do, you remember that the little ants were working tirelessly to provide food for the larger grasshoppers, who even though they were stronger, only used that strength to exploit the ants, like a landlord. The CGI in the movie is a little dated, but it's still a very cute movie and Ginger Minge is actually in it. So I would check it out. So in this metaphor, the grasshoppers are like bosses, greedy touring companies, crappy streaming services, or predatory drag venue owners. And the ants are workers. They do drag. Let's get sick me! Yeah! Yeah! When it comes time to decide what to pay you, any business is going to prefer an individual negotiation with each worker, even though that's a lot more hassle for them. Because in that scenario, they know that they're big and you're a just a small individual. And so they know that they can exploit that power dynamic and take more from you. But with a union, we the ants are able to stand up to the grasshoppers and demand respect because there are a lot more of us than there are of them. Did that hurt? <laughs> nope. <laughs> How about this? At the end of the day... Ants don't serve grasshoppers! It's you who need us! Did you ever notice how, um, Disney never made a sequel to A Bug's Life? I think it's because those ants achieved a worker-owned paradise, and Disney didn't want people knowing about that. No business can profit or even exist if people decide not to work for them, because getting work done, aka the labor, is literally the most important part of the business process. Don't fuck with me, fellas! <laughs> there are a lot of different ways to govern a union, and unions can take many shapes, but in concept, that is all that a union is. It is a group of people who have decided to have each other's back in a negotiation. So for part one of this video, we're gonna talk about why every drag performer needs a union, from the girl in the shake and go wig doing a Pussycat Dolls number on Amateur Night to literally RuPaul Charles, and how unions work both locally and on a national level. In part two, we're gonna bust some myths about unions, and in part three, I'm going to detail how a drag union like this could theoretically get up and running immediately. Hopefully all of the backstage tea that I've collected about like drag race will keep your little f attention for the length of the video, and you'll learn a little bit about unions. 
But maybe not. Maybe you're Matty Morphosis, in which case, happy Super Bowl. Part one, why drag needs to organize. There are three big problems in drag right now. Safety, finances, and fairness. First, let's talk about safety. Jan, you are safe. Maybe you think queens like Trixie Mattel and Bianca Del Rio are very comfortable, and I'm sure they are. You know, they don't tell you about having about 11 houses is that you're always kind of in this state where you're deciding which one is gonna be your main house. But let me tell you a secret, it's always changing. So let's put the superstars aside for a second and just focus on local queens. To make money from our art, drag performers in the past and today with those couple exceptions, are almost always relegated to exclusively gay spaces, which are often businesses operating with razor thin margins because they're catering to such a niche market. And because of the threats of violence that are ever increasing in this country are only functional or safe thanks to the whims of the local police. And if you Google how queer people and people of color are treated on average by the police, it's not comforting. In fact, all across the country, conservatives are attacking drag performers and trying to prevent us from achieving stable or even physically safe working conditions. For example, even the New York Public Library can't safely offer a drag story time without threats of violence to the participating families and protesters literally breaking into the home of an elected official. Child predator, just some of the homophobic tropes being hurled at council member Eric Botcher, who's openly gay. The words were scrawled outside his Chelsea home. Some of the same protesters allegedly stormed his office yesterday afternoon and vandalized the wall, then broke into his apartment building hours later before writing graffiti outside. <laughs> A neighbor who tried to intervene was seen on camera being assaulted and thrown to the ground. What are you, a p the Manhattan lawmaker backed the event, where a person dressed in drag read children's stories and colored with kids. By the way, if you don't like the program, don't go to it. Love living in this liberal coastal bubble. <laughs> this is not the New York that Liza Minnelli was singing about. And that is with record funding to the NYPD. So... Would you look at that? Eric Adams did cut the library budget the other day, though, so. The recent mass shooting at the Q nightclub in Colorado Springs was also partially inspired by the fact that a drag show had been held there in the days before. Five people were killed and 25 were injured, 19 of those by gunfire. So that is what we are facing right now. Shootings like that one or the one at the Pulse nightclub or in the countless other places across the United States where drag performers are threatened by domestic terrorists every single day of the year. And if you think that striking it big with fame and fortune is going to make you exempt from that current reality, I would remind you that there are literally bomb threats against DragCon every year, and DragCon could only be making more money if it were a LuLaRoe convention. But not all of these events are even paying for security. Some of them don't even have a single bouncer. A union could make having an approved security guard a requirement for a venue of a certain size that wants to show drag. And they could even be security guards that we background check to ensure that they have a history of treating the queer community with respect. There are also other kinds of safety that drag performers need to think about. Just a reminder that unless you're Valentina, COVID is very much still a real thing. For drag stars who are touring right now, they're super likely to get sick because they meet a ton of people. And they're super likely to pass that sickness around to each other over and over because they're together in really tight spaces for long periods of time. There are reports that this is happening and that people are not being properly quarantined or compensated for their sick time on some of these bigger drag tours. There's also the threat of the old-fashioned flu to think about and any other communicable diseases that pop up. So the people organizing these tours are gonna really need to start paying for adequate testing and extended hotel stays in town with, you know, doctor's visits and sick leave and all of that, because that's the only way we're all gonna stay safe. 
Maybe when someone does get sick on one of those tours, we could require a touring company to hire local talent to fill in the slot. Why should a good gig for a huge audience go to waste? You know what I mean? Listen, as it is right now, drag artists are so unsafe that going to these towns and managing to organize and put up a drag show is literally the premise of HBO's We're Here. But it must be said that, like the performers on that show, we perform all the time anyway. We put on our painful outfits to be contracted to do physical stunts and audience interaction with no preparation, usually no precautions, and no security on hand to protect us even from accidents. Oop, daddy, work, Charlie X, yes, snatch my wig. As people in the queer community, we have all seen how gay bars work. Some of them are still literally controlled by the mafia. And at bigger venues, individual performers have no leverage at all for negotiating on their own. Businesses, especially local ones, are going to cut every corner possible to save a little bit of money, whatever the consequence, until it is too late. It happens constantly to people in nightlife, especially in marginalized or alternative spaces where people are going to feel lucky to even be a part of things. Even the good bars that there are don't really know what we need until we tell them. And if they then suddenly aren't willing to give us that bare minimum, we have to somehow make it feasible for us to organize and boycott working at unsafe venues if we need to. Some of us are out here death dropping onto pieces of broken glass because venues don't even bother to sweep their floors. We could also reward bars that decide to work with us on basic safety guidelines, which could include like signage in their bar to let people know that we endorse the place and that we would like them to spend their money there. Oh, and speaking of, that brings us to drag's second big crisis right now, Monet. Most performers are curating, if not outright designing and constructing all of their own looks, down to making jewelry and wig styling professions that are other people's full-time art forms with their own unions, I will point out. <coughs> On top of that, we are rehearsing our actual performances. If you think about it, that's an enormous amount of upfront cost just to learn how to do this art form, let alone constructing everything you need for your first gig. A union could also facilitate resource and material sharing uh, through mutual aid. Our looks are also constantly prone to being damaged because drunk audiences kind of run roughshod over performers and threaten to withhold our tips if we don't adjust our personal boundaries. Don't touch drag queen faces. This is really not nice. We don't like this. You know, we love you all, we love to entertain you, you know, but we take a lot of time to make our makeup. And if you start to touch our faces, you're gonna destroy everything, baby. Don't do it. So these looks are not only expensive as fuck, but they're constantly needing to be replaced. And that doesn't even mention the makeup that we have to use each and every time we work, which just goes down the drain at the end of the night. The cost of the creative process is obviously gonna fall on the artist, and that's fine if the artist is making enough coin, right? Some people are making their own looks by hand. That's tons of hours sunk into this art form before you even make minimum wage. And almost all of us are getting ourselves to and from the gig, leaving us wide open to being hate crimed exactly when and where we're likely to get hate crimed the most, outside of gay bars at night wearing clothing designed to catch people's attention. A union could start requiring that venues organize safe shuttles to and from drag events. Even drag artists who don't perform at live venues are subject to attacks for their art, including by mainstream media outlets like the New York Post. Alexis Bevels, I'm sure, performs live, but I mainly know her from her huge internet following. And she was actually recently targeted by the New York Post with lies and misrepresentations that I'm not going to repeat here, but trust me, I am a journalist. These were easily verifiable facts, and they 100% chose to lie about them for outrage and clicks, leading to harassment of Alexis by, you guessed it, right-wing terrorists threatening her physical safety. That is currently the reward for creating queer art, for participating in the economy as an entrepreneur by creating a business. 
in America, the land of opportunity and free speech. <laughs> Right-wingers are currently addicted to calling us child girls and f***ers. Meanwhile, every other profession and class of person has an organized, legally recognized organization to speak out for them as a group with a message that they all agree on and that their elected representatives deliver. Right now, we as drag performers are currently putting pressure on RuPaul to speak out to the national press on behalf of all of us, which is not a position I think she is particularly enjoying. Meanwhile, Nina West and Jimbo, the nicest, most delightful artists around, are being slandered and threatened right now. Honestly, things have gotten so absurd that I almost think it is a performance piece by Jimbo. <laughs> And beyond us as a group, if something terrible happens to us personally, most artists right now are uninsured or underinsured because this is not a career path that comes complete with a benefits package. Even just hurting your knee at one gig could destroy some of our finances. And that is really the core of the problem right now and why safety isn't even the typical drag performer's most pressing concern. For the vast, vast majority of drag artists, even for some in the most elite circles of the industry, the economics of doing drag just don't make a ton of sense right now. This is for everyone that ever believed in me. Performers are often booking their gigs completely informally with no legally binding contract uh, over DMs or at best an email with a promoter. And if they do ever actually see a real contract, they often don't have any representation familiar enough with drag to make any difference anyway. Often performers are showing up to their gigs to find out that the terms of their performance agreement have changed suddenly or that they've just been bumped from the lineup. And of course, we always have to respond to this perfectly professionally, lest we get a reputation for being difficult and then never get that booking again. A union could generate standard agreements with any guarantees that we as a community want to see. So, for instance, we could set minimum booking fees or a minimum percentage deal on the alcohol sold or, say, a single security guard, you know? I keep picturing a lesbian with a medieval mace. How dare you? Lesbians, we stick together. There have also been public scandals of establishment queens or venue owners systematically shutting out minority performers or requesting that they stick to numbers based strictly on racial stereotypes. And while I don't know the particulars of any of those reported on or rumored about cases, I do think that we can all agree that situations similar to that are happening all the time, coast to coast, in every city which really sucks for the minority performers being shut out, obviously. And it even really sucks for the establishment queens fielding those kinds of accusations. Because if we're being honest, without a formal investigation by peers who understand the industry, there is no way to really get justice for anyone. If some of us are lucky enough to attract management, it's also usually not great management. In particular, there are a suite of management and touring companies that have created these little mini monopolies on the higher earning drag artists, usually drag queens, because they don't tend to put drag kings or non-monarchical drag artists on TV. You think drag queen and you have an image in your mind, and you think drag king and you have an image in your mind, even though there's like so many different ways to express those things. I'm not a drag king or a drag queen. I'm a drag thing. Once I took away those expectations of like, I need to perform this way, it sort of opened things up for me. Because a few of these companies hold so much outsized power in the industry, even the biggest queens end up waiting weeks or months to actually get paid their own booking fees by these assholes who already got the money. We have found this out thanks to some queens breaking their silence and maybe their NDAs about living in circumstances like these. Like, for example, we have heard from Carrie Colby, Willow Pill, and Cornbread from RuPaul's Drag Race Season 14. Listen, when I am on stage, I am mostly just having fun. I am not known for doing cartwheels. I am known for talking. Thank you very much. But we are all still workers doing a real physical job in the real dangerous world that takes a real toll on our knees and our skin and our spines and our sanity. 
We don't get a 401k or a retirement plan, let alone health care. The least we can ask for is being paid the money we've already earned for a company or a venue on time. And short paying for your own lawyers, the only people who could step in in a situation like that with legal resources would be a union. The vote is 29 to 28. In favor of them. Um... Oh, in favor of unionizing. <laughs> So if things are so bad, why would anyone do drag? Why did I just quit my job to do this full time? Well, it's a calling, of course, but there are actual rewards to be obtained should you beat the odds at drag. And, you know, most people are not going to do that. By definition of the phrase, beating the odds. Like, I'm probably not going to beat the odds. You're probably not going to beat the odds. But if somebody like RuPaul was to take a liking to you, all your dreams could come true. So let's talk about the elephant in the room. <coughs> Looking at the situation from the outside, and I will likely always be very much on the outside, I think the queens from Drag Race have kind of the perfect use case for a union. And that's because of drag's third controversial problem. Fairness. Willem, will you please step forward? It has come to my attention that you have broken the rules. Rules that are in place to protect the fairness of this competition. So if you've made it this far into the video, I probably don't need to explain to you what RuPaul's Drag Race is, but just in case, I will make this quick. As quick as I can. <laughs> Tell me, do you think a black belt would go with this outfit? Hey, yeah! Everybody say love! Everybody say love! Everybody say love! Since supermodel You Better Work launched his career into the mainstream, RuPaul has gone on to host countless TV shows, appear in feature films, and dominate queer culture. The bulk of her success today is thanks to a show called RuPaul's Drag Race. Drag Race is a weekly competition reality show where a group of hand-selected performers compete, showcasing their talents in makeup, sewing, acting, singing, stand-up comedy, dancing, acrobatics, salesmanship, marketing, lip-syncing, and more. Every iteration of the show is created by the queer-owned media company World of Wonder, who has steered the show through its many, 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 many network changes. The franchise is indisputably the biggest thing in the $1 billion drag industry, with its stars dominating the queer community's live events circuit truly around the world. Here are all the versions of the show we've gotten so far. RuPaul's Drag Race, RuPaul's Drag Race All-Stars, RuPaul's Drag Race Global All-Stars, RuPaul's Secret Celebrity Drag Race, RuPaul's Drag U, Queen of the Universe, RuPaul's Drag Race UK, RuPaul's Drag Race Down Under, Canada's Drag Race, Drag Race Thailand, Drag Race Holland, Drag Race Espana, Drag Race France, Drag Race Italia, Drag Race Germany, Drag Race Mexico, Drag Race Brazil, The Switch, Drag Race, Drag Race Philippines, Drag Race Belgique, Drag Race Sverge, Canada's Drag Race Canada vs. the World, RuPaul's Drag Race UK, UK vs. the World, RuPaul's Drag Race Untucked, RuPaul's Drag Race Philippines Untucked, RuPaul's Drag Race All-Stars Untucked, RuPaul's Drag Race Holoslay Spectacular, RuPaul's Drag Race Vegas Review, and, if you want to count it, RuPaul's Drag Race Corona Can't Keep a Good Queen Down. We are now approaching the limits of where a show like this can even legally be produced. And thanks to Drag Race, you can also see drag front and center on other TV shows right now, like Legendary, Dragula, Call Me Mother, Drag Den, and We're Here. And yes, I have watched all of those shows. At some point, I, I don't even know who I'm watching or where in the world they are. I know vaguely what they're doing, which is drag, but it is just a swirl of wigs and catchphrases and plastic breasts every night of the week in my apartment. And these are just the shows that they're making with TV networks. There's also merch sales and makeup lines and music and podcasts and live shows and tours and gobs and gobs and gobs of spin-off content on streaming services like World of Wonder's proprietary WoW Presents Plus. The franchise would go on to include brand extensions, including the RuPaul's Drag Race Superstar mobile app and the really successful drag con events across the world. 
The drag race empire is an enormous, complex, and sophisticated business that I can't fit into one video. Drag queens from the show have made it from Broadway to the Billboard charts. Super Bowl adds to Oscar-winning films to stadium shows. RuPaul regularly collects at the Emmys. There are politicians who do all of their public appearances in drag now, and the queens from Drag Race are, without exception, the most successful and famous of all ununionized queer people on TV. Sorry specifically to Coco Kane. This is disrespectful. Baby, you deserve to be seen by millions. Drag Race is the most financially rewarding, highest profile, and most prestigious opportunity available in our art form. Drag Race absolutely vaults many, many, many performers to huge success. Just look at Venus Delight. And that enormous role in the marketplace gives it almost complete control of the conversation around drag in mainstream culture. So, if the drag business is booming in 2023, how could a union help out? Well, to audition for Drag Race, a queen must submit a self-made audition tape that they have to pay to produce, packed with their funniest characters, their best looks, a couple of lip syncs, their complete sob story. Hi, I'm Toast, and this is my audition tape for RuPaul's Drag Race Season 14. I've been doing drag for one and a half hours, but I know that I'm good enough to be America's next drag superstar. From there, producers select a handful of those hopefuls to move on to a round of interviews, where they then try to determine what those queens can offer them. And so, at that point, a dozen or so queens are invited to join the franchise. The actual contract that those queens sign changes season to season, as most TV contracts do. So, although some of the details from the past have leaked out from other YouTubers... Hi, ugly. Why does she pronounce it bussy? Isn't it pronounced b****? Am I gonna have to bleep that? Is that why she pronounces it bussy? So she can say to Susan Wojcicki, it's about a bus? Anyway, I don't want to cite things that are out of date or only rumored to be true, so if I get something wrong, I tried. Okay, this is all alleged. I have seen every episode of The Good Wife and The Good Fight, so I don't know what more you wanted me to do. I'm just kidding. Um, this is all alleged, but I have done research. Trust but verify. <laughs> so let's talk about some of those problems with the show. First, let's start with the obvious. Uh, while Drag Race fans spend a ton of money, theme isn't always all that it's cracked up to be, let's say. Drag Race fans have doxxed queens, publicly gossiped about their personal lives, and made false accusations of sexual assault against them just this month alone. Specifically sorry to Roxy Andrews, because I know she jokes about it, but the bus stop memes... It's pretty dark, guys. Don't tell me nothing, I'm just gonna have fun So keep the party jumping so up Listen, can anyone ever really know what they're agreeing to when they agree to this kind of fame? Some queens have had breakdowns while filming the show and quit it mid-season, citing fear of retribution by the vicious public. As with anything that reaches this level of success, there's not really anything anyone can do to control the fandom at this point. But what a union can do is protect a performer's reputation in the press. Unions can provide mental health resources and affordable insurance to workers who need them. A union can connect you with other workers who have been through similar issues, without the social stigmas attached to asking your boss, or your friends, or family, or castmates for help. Then there are the obvious safety issues that World of Wonder has yet to publicly address. Willow Pill won season 14, but her entire storyline on the show was basically footage of her struggling with a disability that wasn't being accommodated by anyone other than her fellow competition. From just the goodness of their hearts. Willow winning the show does not actually erase the need for accessibility options in a competition like this. Because Willow should not have had to struggle like that at all. Let alone on camera in her first appearance in front of millions of people worldwide on a show where people are frequently, and I mean frequently, getting injured due to an alleged lack of rehearsal time and rest. I guess when you're filming a dozen franchises a year, time is kind of money. According to Peppermint, one infamous cheerleading challenge apparently left every single cast member injured, with only one of those injuries actually making the final edit for the public to know about. 
Drag is absolutely hard on the body, but with all of Paramount's resources, there's really no reason drag race should be. From what I can glean at home, being on the show is an incredibly taxing experience on a person both emotionally and physically, but also extremely taxing financially. Canada's Drag Race winner Isis Couture spent $70,000 Canadian on looks for the show before walking off of Canada versus the world due to her issues with production. Again, that's a person who won their show once. Like, it's really hard to, like, pretend like you're okay when you're really not. And it's a show about, like, and everyone was so amazing on that show. There's a lot of stuff that happened with production that I don't necessarily um, agree with. Don't agree what's happening here. I don't agree what you guys are doing to me. I don't agree with the way that I feel. And I'm getting to a certain age where it's like, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be able to do this. And honestly, that's not an unheard of amount of money for someone to spend. Queens who go on Drag Race must produce almost all of the original looks that you see them wearing every week, from the nails, to the wigs, to the padding, to the outfits, to the props, to the special effects. Queens on the show are given a brief for every runway look, save the design challenge, obviously. And not only must those looks be entirely new to fit the challenge's design, they must also be designed, sourced, created, executed, and then approved by the producers in just a few short weeks leading up to filming. Oh, 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 and did I not mention all of this drag has to fit within a certain weight and size limit that each queen is allowed to physically bring to set? So that makes this a game of fashion design, transportation logistics, monopoly, and guerrilla warfare, all on your own dime before you've even entered the workroom. been rumors that some franchises of the show are providing performers with small stipends for materials now, but even if that is true, they don't always and they are not required to keep doing that. A union could make that budget fair and make the turnaround time for looks a little more reasonable. Can I tell you, that is the cheapest cotton ever that I hand tie-dyed myself and my mom printed out those cherub stickers for me and I applicated them myself. And I had to spray them with matte spray paint because they were shiny. And a union could guarantee that the show doesn't just randomly change its mind about the rules whenever it's convenient for them. I personally don't think that there's really a way for artists to compete, like not to get all boule about this, but to me, you can compare art and you can prefer art, but there's no way to really objectively rank artists. But Competition does make a hell of a format for reality TV shows, and reality TV shows make a hell of a format for delivering drag. And I fucking love Drag Race. Listen, audiences understand that Drag Race isn't exactly a meritocracy. We understand that this started as a parody of a reality show. Attention cheer trolls, let the tryouts begin. Start your engines, may the best Tuckaho win. And I personally know that it's not cool to ask the teacher about the rules. I'm not completely unself-aware. But we have to be honest that this is reality. And for a lot of young people growing into this profession, the drag race crown is the object of desire that they've been planning decades of their own work around. I've had this weird kind of tunnel vision about this show for such a long time. Every move that I made in drag was kind of like, am I going to be a drag race queen if I make that decision? If I buy this garment, is it going to look good on drag race? And I don't have to worry about that anymore. And that's kind of like this weird liberating feeling. And like, that's not even an exaggeration. People who are winning the show now are winning it by devoting themselves to this since childhood, which, you know, that's something that happens on popular game shows. Look at Survivor, or Jeopardy, or Top Chef. But when a corporate-owned show has such an outsized role in an oppressed community, and that community is powering the show and the art form to mainstream audiences, it delegitimizes what these people are working for and drag itself when you ask people to gamble with their life's work for entertainment purposes only. Fairness on the show doesn't mean that the rules have to be boring or static or that producers won't be able to shape storylines for the reality show portion of things. We all want twists and we all want gags and we all want fresh ideas and big characters and heroes' journeys and feuds. But tonight I'm sending home 
ทันใจนะAnd sometimes kind of exploitative. Sometimes on Drag Race you can't talk to family members, even if your or their mental health requires it, but sometimes you can. Sometimes you can't bring drugs or alcohol, even if you're actively in withdrawals, which makes sense from a production standpoint, but then again, sometimes you can. Oops. Sometimes we want to see a family resemblance, which means being identical, except when it doesn't and when we don't. Sometimes contestants get extra takes for their entrances or exits. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes we're judging everything you do at the competition, and sometimes we're only judging what we can see on stage or on screen. Sometimes breaking the rules gets you disqualified. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes eliminations themselves don't even matter. Sometimes you get voted out. Sometimes you have to reveal information that will make your competitors dislike you or your coworkers work against you. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes on that show you can say racial slurs, and sometimes you can't even take the Lord's name in vain. Without being disqualified. That was in Italia, though. And side note, guys, Italy is fucking scary. <laughs> It's even recently come to light that the judges on the show, who we see on screen narratively credited with the episode outcomes, like Carson Cressley or Ross Matthews, who are on every week, actually have zero control over who progresses in their competition, which. Kind of has to sting for them too, right, Brooklyn Heights? Why don't they just let her host that show? What is going on up there? Two queens from the American version of the show have alleged sleeping with producers, with Willem also divulging that some producers didn't even know all of the contestants' names. Not that RuPaul does. <laughs> Seattle, Seattle. Which girl I get. I mean, you're meeting 150 drag queens a year and they all look like Raven. But when your food, medicine, housing, and access to the outside world is controlled by producers, I'm kind of not sure which situation is worse to be in, assaulted or neglected. The situation has reportedly improved since Willem's days on the show. For example, according to Gottmik, queens now have 24-7 access to queen care, which is a therapist they can talk to while filming. According to Gottmik, it apparently took one performer expressing suicidal ideation for the show to finally provide queen care. And now they're providing it just, you know, it's a good financial investment to prop everybody up for the filming of the whole season. Willem has also pointed out that the pit crew doesn't wear shoes in an active workroom and like a film set, which... If you know anything about either of those, it does not seem safe. These are my favorite outfits the pit crew has ever yeah, worn. It's the yeah. <laughs> Trend alert. Mm -hmm. But we're not here to talk about the pit crew because Hollywood labor unions have almost zero power over unscripted reality show production right now. Despite the fact that nearly every guest judge you see on screen week to week is themselves part of an entertainment industry union. Actually, working or appearing on Drag Race is wildly underpaid compared to what other performers on non-reality programs make, despite the fact that reality shows are also cheaper for the networks to produce. No actor on MTV would accept the day rate offered to a RuPaul's Drag Race queen, and those queens are almost definitely doing far, far more work than whatever actor. The girls on Drag Race are effectively paying for the privilege of unsafe working conditions in exchange for screen time, some tour dates, and maybe a better paid local gig when they get back home. But it can be hard to know which way is up when the producers of your dream project are ingratiating themselves with you as friends or colleagues. I'll probably never get within 100 feet of RuPaul, but if you do go on that show one day, please know that while those producers may be polite and professional and 
even kind, they're not your colleagues, let alone your friends. So this is a setup and I'm, <clears throat> I'm the old, old desperate one. Producers have different contracts with a show and maybe even staff positions on a show, meaning that they have different protections and incentives and value to the company than you do. It's good to remember that at least on their first season, the queens who do the show are just freelancers who are very lucky to be there. And maybe I'm being dramatic, you know, I've never been on Drag Race. Maybe all of the contestants love their time filming the show, but we wouldn't know about that because right now, as it is, Drag Race is not accountable to the larger drag community at all. I mean, all of us complaining could barely get the show to allow trans competitors, let alone the fight we had to pitch to convince RuPaul to stop saying transphobic catchphrases. And like, I don't hold that against her at this point. She apologized and they've made changes and trans people have won the show. And frankly, us in the trans community took way too long to have those discussions anyway. But the point is that evolution on the show was not really as long ago as people would like to pretend. And since it already took us years to get them to listen, we should probably stop talking individually on our social media accounts and organized to speak together in a way that a massive media corporation can't ignore in the future. In many ways, ballroom events or competitions like Miss Gay America or Drag Race are similar to mainstream sports. Drag Race in particular has these athletic performers competing for a fan culture of live viewing events and statisticians and fantasy leagues. They've even got corporate sponsorships and merchandise to prove it. And for local bars, consuming drag like sports is an incredibly profitable state of affairs. World of Wonder has a boutique streaming service entirely supported just for drag competitions, which is something that only like the MLB can financially justify right now. The MLB does have better subtitles though. I could do better subtitles for Drag Race Philippines than World of Wonder, and I do not speak any of those languages. So Drag Race is like sports, with its own Olympians, like Katya. But unless you play the Patriots, sports are supposed to be fair. Sports are supposed to be objective. You either ran the fastest or you didn't. Even for games with subjective rules or Olympic sports like gymnastics or ice dancing that have subjective outcomes, the rules are clearly established beforehand and the judges are selected due to their mainstream acceptance by competitors as experts. Rarely do you see a star from the Disney Channel or some crappy Broadway Nepo baby judging the Olympics. Unless you want to count Johnny Weir. But you know who you will see judging episodes of Drag Race? A YouTuber called Tondrick Hall, who has an extensive history of allegations against him, including fraud, wage theft, and abuse. You guys might have a big Twitter following, but I have fans too. And up until now, I have not unleashed my fans on anybody, but you're about to find out exactly how my fans feel about you bullying me. Have a good day. And who notoriously hired contestants from the show to work a private party for him and then skipped out on paying them while he was on the show with them. And the production company behind the show didn't blacklist him from their productions until one of the show's biggest performers, Kennedy Davenport, the dance and diva of Texas, made a public accusation against him that he was abusing girls on set during the competition because the other queen's frustrations were not being taken seriously behind the scenes. Todrick is now buried in lawsuits, but for legal purposes, I will repeat that all of this is alleged. Drag Race makes money like sports, but in ways that actually affect drag performers, Drag Race isn't like sports at all. Sports have safety equipment requirements. Sports are insured. When players do go professional in sports, athletes have contracts with their teams which provide for their health and well-being during their time in the public eye and well after they've retired which is another thing that professional athletes and actors can do, which drag performers almost universally do not have a plan for. Retirement. Unions are great at helping workers obtain benefits packages. The show itself encourages the comparison to sports, often mentioning that drag is, quote, not a contact sport, and earnestly calling itself, quote, the Olympics of drag. Controversially, the creator and host of the show also said that trans women competing would somehow be equivalent to athletes at the Olympics taking steroids. Obviously, again, the show has walked that policy back, but 
that statement gives us insight into how the creator of the show does now see this as a real competition that requires real rules to be fair. The highest honor awarded to a lifelong drag artist who has sacrificed everything for that title has been decided for over a decade worldwide by an arbitrary group of reality TV producers for ratings. And even the winners of the show aren't actually always treated with respect. For example, the show recently did an all-winner season, inviting back previous winners of the show to throw down in what they billed as the show's ultimate season, a victory lap for the biggest success stories and a love letter to the fans. But in creating the fantasy of these drag legends battling it out week after week, the queens were asked to misrepresent the situation. In one particularly egregious example, an interviewer asked drag icon Raja what she would be spending her $75,000 in winnings on. You know, I didn't win that much f***ing money. I mean, I won $75,000. This was 11 years ago, you know, so the prize money was different. I think people have an expectation with the amount of money that you win that you're supposed to have all of these riches and, and I don't know. If it were me in that position, I probably would have chewed someone out about how that $50,000 check is actually just $25,000 after taxes, which Raja almost certainly already spent on the drag she needed to even appear on the show, let alone all the money she lost by devoting a year of her life to the show's production, shooting, airing, and promotion, none of which, of course, she's being compensated for. And not every queen on that show is going to be so lucky. Raja may be left with the same amount of cash in her pocket, maybe, but some of the queens probably leave in debt. You've won a cash prize of $5,000. I don't want some cash, bitch. I can pay for a <laughs> costume. <laughs> Think about how much money Lemon wasted that one time. God, I miss Lemon. Put Lemon on more seasons. The all winter season was also kind of robbed of any conclusion or formal closure which is something that I assume a reality TV producer would want because the queens couldn't reach an agreement with production about a format for a reunion that would tell their stories in a more fair and equitable way than they have been in the past. The queens from the all winter season went so far as to organize a shoot for their own private reunion before the show found a way to keep them from doing that. So even on their own, on their own dime, with the show contractually taking a cut of their income, they couldn't speak out about their own experiences as winners. That's bonkers. It should be noted, however, that the reason the all winner season had no eliminations is because the winners organized and demanded that. By organizing and making demands, they got massive concessions from production that led to them getting a lot more screen time. This is RuPaul's best friend, no right? And even if a competitor decides not to go back to the show, it's not like being a winner means that you can escape the industry's conditions. I've personally seen season 10 winner Aquaria working a private live event that was being thrown by the extremely wealthy media corporations Grindr and Netflix for that show Uncoupled, if you remember it, starring Neil Patrick Harris. They were doing a premiere party event at a major venue in New York City that I went to, and during that show, on mic, Aquaria requested that the wet stage that she was being asked to perform on be wiped down so that she didn't slip because she was wearing giant heels. Not only was that pretty normal safety request not properly accommodated, uh, after she requested and restarted her performance for it multiple times on mic in front of an industry audience, she then nearly snapped her neck in front of me and then needed to leave the stage for her own safety entirely. Later that night, I watched event producers from Netflix and Grindr in a deep, involved argument with Aquaria herself, not even her representation, about the situation, when what they should have been doing was getting her a car and a check and an apology. And maybe they eventually did, but without the backing of a union, they didn't really have to. Before my eyes, those giant media corporations could have genuinely made this artist, who has achieved the highest heights of success that a drag performer can reasonably expect in that lifetime, snap her neck. She could have snapped her neck in front of me before she turned 30 to promote a failed sitcom that she wasn't even asked to appear on. And I can guarantee that nobody making that sitcom was compensated as unfairly for unsafe work as Aquaria was that night. And I'd argue that she works harder 
at a lot more stuff than any actor. But because there is just so much money to be made off of drag right now, there is also the alternate TV model of Dragula, which is Drag Race's spooky, scary sister from two different misters. And the situation over there is only marginally better. On Dragula, the creators and hosts of the show, The Bullies, maintain a much closer relationship with their contestants than RuPaul and company do. And those contestants can even include drag kings, which is something that Drag Race still hasn't been able to do. Presumably, The Bullies saw the rate at which Drag Race was burning through drag talent and decided to try to be a little more conscious in their work. But that closeness with the contestants also raises its own issues. There was a scandal recently involving a group chat between the performers of color from Dragula where they were comparing notes on racial discrimination that they had perceived behind the scenes. But then this group chat, which was happening during the height of the Black Lives Matter protests, was then leaked by one contestant to the Boulets because they had a close relationship with them. But do you see how even compassionate social relationships in business can get really messy really fast? After the incident, the contestant that leaked it went on to be cast in and win the show's special resurrection season, the prize for which was another place on the show's fourth season where that same contestant made it to the final round of the competition. While the Belays have a long history of professionalism, the truth is that because of how these shows are produced, we'll never really know whether or not some contestants are getting special treatment which sucks for the competitors and sucks for the audience, but ultimately also sucks for the owners and hosts of these shows. Nobody really wins in a situation where we all lose legitimacy. Except maybe short-term corporate pocketbooks, but I don't give a shit about those. The artists that leaked those messages also made the choices that they did because they're under the same pressure that basically every drag performer is under. Intense financial pressure that exacerbates every other problem that you might have. So, them turning to an authority figure and someone who has been a mentor to them for advice, while messy and unfair, is kind of a natural thing to happen without any other structures in place of support. So don't be a little bitch about this. You don't get an opinion on that show. You weren't on it. And leave Mary Cherry alone. But the biggest secret that producers of shows like this don't want you to know is that they don't actually usually care about what the rules are or even who really ends up winning any of the dozen seasons they produce a year. What they actually care about is making money from this, and they do not want to share that money. As a company, they're required to behave like that. But the short-term profits from reality TV drama don't change the fact that The Crown means everything to the people competing for it. And unlike professional wrestling, the audience and the competitors believe what they're seeing is a real fair test of charisma, uniqueness, nerve, talent, drag, filth, horror, glamour, whatever. But the truth is that the rules are made up, the points don't matter, and at Drag Race at least, Drag Kings need not apply. For now. I'd like to see what a union would have to say about that though, wouldn't you, Land Insider? Again, none of this Drag Race and Dragula bullshit would be any more offensive to me than The Voice or The Masked Singer if those shows didn't have so much power over the industry. The near ubiquitous consumption of Drag Race by the queer community is an incredibly profitable state of affairs for World of Wonder and Voss events and Paramount, but it means that they bear an enormous responsibility to us, the LGBTQIA community. If an artist's entire public persona can be destroyed from a few poorly edited moments, we need clear and defined rules that make even an attempt at fairness in this competition. We can and should hold very profitable shows like this to a higher standard. So that's Drag's three big problems, safety, finances, and fairness. Obviously, that's not every injustice that's going on in drag right now, and I'm sure people who have been on television or on tour have a lot more specific complaints in common than I can think of. But can we at least admit that there is some room for improvement in this industry? Both the Boulets and Drag Race have hired former contestants to join the show as production staff but that practice ended at Drag Race. Unless, you know, they need to put celebrities in drag, then they'll hire queens to do it for them, of course. One time they tried hiring from within the family after RuPaul split with her longtime makeup collaborator Matthew Anderson, reportedly over a financial dispute. The show hired contestants Delta Work and Raven to do RuPaul's hair and makeup. After being nominated for an Emmy, production tried to force Delta Work to join a mainstream hair and makeup union, which she did not feel represented her interests as a drag performer. 
As the story goes, Raven was given the choice to stand by Delta and ask production to compensate them financially for their troubles, and Raven chose instead to tell the show that the pair was, quote, not a package deal. Raven was rewarded for this with years of work as RuPaul's only and exclusive makeup artist, while Delta has been fired and blacklisted. Had Raven and Delta banded together, perhaps they both would have been fired, so... Really, who can fault Raven for making that choice? But had all of the queens from the show banded together? All of them? Not only would RuPaul be stuck in boy drag, but they wouldn't have a show to film. In the years since, Delta has carved out work for herself online and is now the host of Very Delta on the Mom Podcast Network, a drag queen-owned and operated business by Alaska 5000, who won the best season of Drag Race, and Willem, who hurts people's feelings, but in a fun way. Artist-owned businesses tend to treat other artists a lot better than some of these corporations, but queer-owned businesses or shows also aren't enough to move the needle. Unfortunately, these queer-owned businesses put drag performers at odds with each other financially and are subject to buyout, hostile takeover, or bankruptcy just like any other business. At the end of the day, a boss or a venue owner in a wig is still a boss or a venue owner first. A lack of financial compensation or even an ownership stake in the season they were on, which is entirely possible for a union to demand, means that it's access to the mainstream drag fandom that producers have a chokehold on and are gatekeeping. For speaking out, you will never see Willem on All Stars. Delta Work is now an unperson to any drag productions taking place on mainstream TV. Artists who speak out alone can expect to be entirely blacklisted. I'm probably screwed for ever working with World of Wonder because I made this video. Why did I make this video? Right after quitting my job? I don't know. Please subscribe to my Patreon. There should be a Patreon link in the description. I'm going to get real for a second. Drag is expensive, YouTube is expensive, journalism is expensive, and um, none of them pay anything, and I don't have any money. And I just quit my job to do this, so help. Not only have we learned through leaks and whispers that shows like Drag Race take a cut of a performer's earnings after they've appeared on the show, but performers on the show often report pressure to sign with touring management like Voss Events. Voss Events has an extremely close relationship with World of Wonder. Touring companies like Voss Events face constant accusations of abusing queens, abandoning them, destroying their careers through either incompetence or greed, or seriously exploiting them financially, sometimes not even paying the stars of their tours while they're on tour with them. Voss Events also has two pending lawsuits alleging racial discrimination and sexual harassment, but that's alleged. And for some performers, while you're on tour, sometimes they're also being asked to simultaneously be preparing to do another season of the show that made you famous, as happened to Hoso Teratoma, who only had two days each to complete the entirety of her looks for this year's Dragula Titans competition. And that was right after doing the show's fourth season and the show's world tour back to back, which to be fair, the Boulets also did, but the Boulets own the show and aren't competing. So it's a little easier. Maybe not easier, but at least they're compensated for it. Performers are free to refuse a place on Drag Race or on any of these shows, obviously, but if you've already done a season, you're contractually obligated to do any other season that they might ask you to for years after your initial appearance. Presumably, performers refuse these return demands all the time, but isn't it weird that they would want to or that they would have to? If being on Drag Race or Dragula or Call Me Mother wasn't a huge gamble, why would anyone pass on the opportunity to return? One particularly infamous moment on the show involved ballroom legend Michelle Visage. I don't have the expenses to pay for something like this. I'm in a bankruptcy. I just don't have. Hold on. You don't need money, girl. That's never an excuse. I know you can turn a show. What concerns me is the attitude a little bit. Perhaps what Michelle meant to say was that Chi Chi Devane didn't need money to be a star. And that is true, Michelle. Chi Chi Devane was a star long before she ever graced our TV screens, and she will be a star forever. And maybe she didn't need money to be a star. But she did fucking deserve it. Just 16% of working creatives, that's in any industry, are working class. That means 84% of the artists whose work we actually get to see promoted and compensated, 84% are Nepo babies of some form. That should really piss off audiences. Punk, rock and roll, hip hop, graffiti, streetwear, pizza, country music, drag, basically 
anything of any cultural value from the last century was created by poor people. I mean, just think of all the incredible work that we're missing out on because nobody has taken the time to rethink the wasteful economics of drag, and so lots of artists can't even get started. Part 2. Myths about unions Myth. Unions cost too much money. Unions don't actually cost members anything in the organizing stage, because why would you pay for something that isn't actually working for you yet? And while unions do require funding, there are lots of ways to accomplish that. It's probably true that union members will one day have to devote a very small percentage of their income to dues, but what's being left out of that story is that union members end up making more money, a lot more money, than the union costs them. So, yeah, you might have to invest in the union just like you invest in anything else, but the good news is, unlike a drugstore makeup haul video, this investment is a safe bet. Myth. Unions are too outdated for drag. While it's true that union membership has been declining in the U.S. for decades, not coincidentally when everyone's working conditions have gotten worse, but there has been a recent uptick in union activity amongst labor for economic reasons that I'm sure you can imagine. Workers at businesses like Starbucks, Apple, Amazon, and Trader Joe's have been unionizing, as have journalists and game developers. Unions can be adapted for any profession because they are designed by the very people working in that profession, from freelancers to musicians. SAG-AFTRA represents actors who do a variety of things in their performances in a variety of types of media. Just like us, bitch. Myth, we're already covered by other performers' unions. As we've highlighted, we don't have any union protecting us in some of the most mainstream drag projects that we participate in as a community. A potential drag union might choose to defer to older, more established unions in their mediums, but drag is its own unique art form with its own unique needs that will require its own unique voice. We as an industry have matured beyond the shadows, so we should stop standing in other people's. Myth. A union is just another boss you have to answer to. A union isn't a third party or another authority that comes in and fixes things. A union literally means the very people who make up the union. Each of them is part of the union equally, even if they're hateful bitches. Myth. Unionizing will take up too much of my time, and I need to be hustling for myself instead. Listen, being in a union means helping out as much or as little as you want. It's about getting the right to be selfish, if that's your choice. It's about the union having your back, even if all you ever do is pay your dues and vote. But if you can give a union a bit more of your time, it could also be the most impactful thing you do in your career. And as a founding member of a drag union, it could be part of your legacy forever. Because while unionizing is not easy, it does change the game in the artist's favor permanently. Myth. Powerful people will make life hell for us if we try to change things. Listen, there will be threats by the powerful, there will be misinformation about unions, and they're gonna attempt to bribe or divide us. They're gonna pit styles of drag against each other, they're gonna pit income classes against each other, they're gonna try to blame Sigourney Beaver, but luckily we know better. The National Labor Relations Board, the official independent government body that regulates unfair labor practices and protects unions, has recently strengthened protections for workers looking to unionize. Today, support for unions in this country is higher than it's been in nearly 60 years. Think about this. You guys know the numbers. Unions are more, have more support today in America in public opinion than any time in 60 years. The key, it's a key way to building the economy, to grow us from the bottom up and the middle out. I'm so sick and tired of trickle-down economics. The National Labor Relations Act guarantees the right of employees to organize and protects workers from the kind of union-busting crap that you might have heard about happening at places like Starbucks. But now, if they break those rules, not only will they be fined, but they will also have to pay the union's expenses and damages. Plus, they've also just made it easier for workers to picket outside of companies that they want to boycott. Side note, can you imagine the hurricane of media attention that would show up if the drag queens of Drag Race decided to form a picket line outside Paramount's LA offices? Outside HBO in New York? If HBO still exists? We could stick Jackie Beat outside AMC. Think about all the shit Meatball would pull at a labor protest. Even Miss Fame can't buy press like that. 
Myth, a union will be dominated by established drag artists or dominated by local queens. This one I have some bad news about. Right now, drag is dominated by established acts, and those established acts all used to be local queens. There really is no divide. A union is here to do everything it can to make the situation better in ways that help everyone in the union. We need to build in systems that are anti-racist and anti-sexist and anti-transphobic right at the beginning of the union, and a union isn't going to magically make everyone in the industry good or fair, but it could establish a way to take on those issues in a smarter, more organized, and more impactful way. So it's still progress. Myth. A union will cap my income. A union does not cap a worker's success or income. They want you to get as much money as possible so that you have more money and power to lend to the union. But this kind of union can also open itself up to anyone getting started. All right, ladies, this is uh, one of our newest apartments. It's state of the art, one of the biggest apartments in oh my Manhattan. God, no, I thought this was like the lobby of the building or yeah, something. Yeah, this is small. It's well, tiny. This is, this is, uh, I mean, we're tiny, but this is super tiny. Ashley, look, I can fit in this cabinet. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Well, this is 30,000 square foot. Um, Numbers, ouch. Um, well, yes, uh, I figured... Where do our bodyguards stay? Yeah. Those are rules that the community can and will decide for itself and can vote to adjust as we see how the policies play out in the real world. That's the whole point of a union. Myth. Unions just aren't compatible with drag culture. To debunk this one, let's go back a bit. Due to the treatment of queer people and artists in recent history in America, which... Spoiler alert, it's not great. Drag as an art form is hard to pin down the origins of. Every culture on earth has documented queerness and queer art about sex or gender, but if we put aside art forms like geisha or Shakespearean theater as separate. William Dorsey Swan was born into servitude and grew up to become one of the first American activists to spearhead a queer resistance group. He was also the first person known to refer to himself as a queen of drag. And that's not all. Swan was the first person to use the legal and political system to fight for the right of the queer community to gather in America. Ooh, exciting. She was a victim of slavery who, in the 1880s, started organizing drag balls in D.C. for other men, probably other former slaves. And those balls were often raided by the police who were trying to keep a community from forming. Since then, from Marsha P. Johnson at Stonewall to politicians like Maybe a Girl, drag artists have stood up for oppressed people and queer labor rights. And in the early days of Hollywood, studios and producers often had complete control over the work of artists much like Drag Race and World of Wonder do now, and could freely use and exploit their work without providing adequate compensation. But it was not until the formation of SAG in 1933 that industry talent achieved fair compensation and a level of control over how their work was being used. Another important issue SAG helps protect is intellectual property rights, which means legally owning the work you create or even appear in so that it can't be hidden or censored. Rights like that would have come in very handy for drag performers recently when HBO Max literally wiped Legendary, the entire TV show, from the internet as if it never existed. They really did that. Check your app. In 1950, the Mattachine Society was formed by Harry Hay, initially focusing on advocating for the rights of gay men in the workforce, because of course it was. Over time, the Mattachine Society expanded to include lesbian members and slowly but steadily became one of the first national LGBTQIA plus rights groups in the country. Since then, organizations such as the Gay Liberation Front, the Gay Activists Alliance, Pride at Work, and the National LGBTQ plus Task Force have been established to focus on labor issues. Unfortunately, while we've been able to pass marriage equality and we are responsible for beating back the AIDS epidemic, we have been unable to pass protections like the Equality Act, which would make it illegal to fire someone just for their sexual or gender identity. Probably the most famous and lasting of the political and social institutions organized by queer people are the balls that emerged from the queer, black, and underfunded performers of New York City and the houses that participate in those events. The ballroom scene came when I was about 19, 20 years old. To me, it was just the most organic, real kind of artistic community I had ever encountered. It was just amazing to me the amount of creativity that existed. And that was really the attraction for me. And then also added to that when I saw the dynamic between the members of the house and what that was like and how they all kind of came together for this common purpose. And they were more like a family. They always 
traveled together wherever they were. They were very supportive of one each other. They were always like pitching in to help one another. And you're protected there. It was very important to a lot of us to be able to be who you are and artistically express yourself. Houses or families can provide professional mentorship, emotional support, and material resources, making those family-sized units kind of like a grassroots version of a union. While drag houses can and should continue to exist, they're amazing. If we can get them backed by a union, they would only be more powerful. Plus, the pressure on drag mothers to educate and advocate for every drag artist in the world is a little much. Unions and drag families could fit together like moms and the PTA. And if you've ever worked or been in the educational system, you probably know how much control the PTA has. So to review, a drag union would be modern, unique, accountable, welcoming, and diverse, and part of a proud queer tradition. Part three, how to unionize drag. So assuming you're now on board, how exactly do we form a union? Well, I have one more list. There are four major steps to forming a union. Step one, starting a conversation. At this stage, you want to talk to every other drag performer that you think might be receptive to the idea. And remember, literally everyone doing drag would benefit from a union. So if you're scared or hesitant to start a conversation like this in such a gossipy industry, just try complaining about your working conditions and seeing if any of your coworkers would be interested in changing things. You might also reach out to someone doing national organizing, say by submitting a contact email to the link in the description, and try to connect with other organizers in your state so that we can get as many people as possible in this community engaging with the idea of a drag union. Hopefully this video is kicking off some process of conversation because if it's unsuccessful, I will seriously need to move out of my apartment and start selling stuff. If this flops and you want to buy this wig, let me know. Again, there is a Patreon link. Step two, reaching out for help. It's at this point that organizers need help standardizing communication, coordinating all the information that they've gathered, and organizing all of those different people and their different talents. Obviously, we have some incredibly smart drag artists in our community already, like the community organizer Miss Toto, or the Reverend Doctor Silky Nutmeg Ganache, or Sasha Velour, who I think is the Pope now? Or Kine, who literally knows math. You're gonna learn how to square any number that ends in five in your head with this mental math trick. But likely at this stage, we're probably going to need some people who do this every day, all day, and who might already have some organizing funding already on hand. But the good news is there are tons of well-funded, experienced union organizers at places like the American Federation of Labor and Congress of Industrial Organizations, or at SAG-AFTRA, who have done all of this before and will do all of this again, and who would be happy to help us get up and running. There's also the American Guild of Variety Performers, who are affiliated with AFL-CIO. They're a labor organization founded in 1939 to represent live stage performers and stage managers. That includes singers and dancers in non theatrical reviews or performers touring in a non-book show. That also includes theme park performers, cabaret performers, comedians, lecturers, poets, variety performers, people performing at private events. And while it's not a strictly queer organization, organizations like that represent a ton of queer artists and queer interests already. Actually, the performers at Medieval Times just formed a union with them. So if they can do it, surely we can. Plus those guys know a bunch of famous people, so that could be cool. Step three, discussion and decisions. There is obviously a need for local independent unions and a need for a national organization, and we're gonna have to balance those out. The great thing is that at this stage, we get to talk amongst ourselves and decide what we believe is the fairest and most equitable way to divide that power. So for example, we might decide that a national union could set a minimum wage or outline specific policies for things like TV shows or world tours. Meanwhile, we could give local branches of a union the power to negotiate specific safety concerns with venues that they already know and work with. Local chapters would also be free to go beyond national guidelines and demand more in places where they think they can get it. Unions form very gradually at first and then all of a sudden in one swift wave of change. And this part of the process is also when we're going to need to formalize things. So that's when we would very quickly form committees and make recommendations and then start selecting local representatives. 
Step four, requesting formal recognition. This is the time when we get really loud and proud about how excited we are about establishing our union. Both so that we can show people in power that we mean business and we're going to be a thorn in their side until they give us what we want, but also so that you yourself as a worker can establish a paper trail of being a union organizer for your own legal protection. It's also at this point that we need to force those we need to renegotiate with to recognize the power of our union and respect that power and meet us at the table. Ha! Ha! This is when every performer would get their hands on an official union card that declared their right to call on the community should they be exploited or attacked. At this stage, I could also see politicians falling over themselves to help us make this kind of a guild or union happen. Did you know that Marty Gould Cummings was literally in the White House meeting with the president this month? Though she did tell me it was more of an eggshell color. Her joke. Listen, Democrats aren't always perfect class allies, but for powerful figures on the left, like Nancy Pelosi, AOC, or Canada's Justin Trudeau, endorsing and supporting a labor union of oppressed entrepreneurs is kind of a slam dunk. This project would probably be the easiest political points that any of those talking heads have ever scored. But while politicians talk a lot about unions, unions aren't really a political issue per se. It's just doing business. While I personally think that socialism is cool and for hot girls, forming a union is not doing a socialism. It's just smarter capitalism. To actually see the kind of rapid transformation that this industry desperately needs, we need the leaders of our community, TV queens, local queens, and social media queens alike, to drop their differences for just this one uniting instance. For our love of drag. In terms of what's already been accomplished, there's been some reporting by Nico Lang of Queer News Daily on the topic. And queens like Alexis Autori have started local organizations like Work is Work, a first-of-its-kind campaign fighting for the fair treatment of drag performers in the Bay Area. When that group was formed, all that it was reported to be asking for was that local bars and nightclubs guarantee a minimum booking fee of $40 a show, which would translate to two numbers at a venue and like two hours work. That's not a lot. At the time, Alexis said, quote, I've had a lot of people who say we should be getting paid $100 minimum, while others are worried about how this might affect the status quo, the existing systems that people have fought so hard to build, unquote. Even those meager requests were slow walked by venues in one of the wealthiest cities in the world, which to me says we need to stop asking for things locally and start demanding things on a national level. Drag queens in Seattle have also been working on this problem in their own city. The adrenaline of coming back from a year and a half not performing started to wear off and the realization that we were being mistreated sunk in. Dubois and Almanza once worked together on stage at Julia's. But according to the two, last Friday that came to an end when a disagreement with their employer over tips ended in their firing. In the days since, a GoFundMe was launched as was a movement. The collective Seattle drag scene came together last night. We're told 30 or so local drag workers met yesterday in the hopes of eventually forming a union with others in the Seattle nightlife industry, united by the collective feeling that venues hold too much power. I think that the burlesque community is probably feeling a lot of what we're feeling. I think that musicians have felt this way for a really long time. Being mistreated and underpaid, and it just gone on for too long. And to bust another myth before it comes up, negotiation can be a long process, but it doesn't mean stopping production of Drag Race or Dragula or Uh or anything else that you love watching. I am not here to say that you shouldn't watch Drag Race or consume any drag TV shows, even if they're deeply flawed. Those are precious showcases for queer performers who have put their entire lives on the line for those opportunities, and it would be really disrespectful to their work and to our art form to boycott the show entirely. Unless, you know, the cast of Drag Race was to ask us to do a boycott on their behalf. But for now, go see Work the World. It's fabulous. Go see The Vegas Show. Unless they hire non-union scabs, then boycott away. Drag Race is a community cornerstone and a cultural landmark that took a long time to achieve, and we should absolutely be enjoying it at every opportunity. But that very importance to us is why we desperately need to make improvements. It's also not fair that the responsibility for solving all of the industry's problems is falling on the shoulders of a few production companies right now, when those companies are not incentivized, designed, or equipped to handle all that responsibility. If anything, some of the cleverer people working at a TV production company would be very excited to hand off a bunch of their problems to someone else.
Remember, RuPaul would also be represented by this union, and working together, we can make demands of Paramount that even she can't alone. And RuPaul, if you are watching this because it showed up in your YouTube recommendations, and I assume you're not, I am a queen who has worked at GLAAD and as a journalist and on a TV game show and at MTV who has already started a union for artists once before. So this is just me following the stage directions of the universe, like you did, and Rue as the most powerful person in the industry. I hope that you can see the vision, because I do have a vision for a future that we can all share. I'd like to see an organization that can help educate aspiring artists and the public on the issues affecting drag. I'd also like to see formal education in the drag arts, not just for us to gain respect for our art form in the academic world, but also as a way to document and credit artists for their unique techniques or ideas. Imagine James Mansfield in residence teaching formal classes on wig sculpting. I imagine a museum of drag staffed by retired members of the local queer community, with legendary drag performers like Linda Simpson or artists like Imp Kid in residence. A place where we could store and display archival pieces of drag that an artist might want to lend or donate to preserve. I imagine mutual aid that could protect the bravest members of the queer community at the moments when they need it the most. But that's just my vision. Maybe yours is different. Maybe it's even better. Imagining great things for ourselves is the first step forward. As an industry, we need to defeat our saboteurs, both outer and inner. Maybe it takes years to finalize the organizing process and settle on representatives and systems of governance for drag, but if you can learn how to make it like this, or this, or this, you can absolutely learn the same system used by student governments. Do you know who got what they wanted by unionizing? The cast of Friends, the Spice Girls, Sally Field, Jane Fonda. I'm not suggesting a drag union because I personally want to lead some movement. I like making little videos on YouTube and I do not need drag race levels of attention. Thank you very much. But the point of a union is that there are plenty of drag performers more capable of leading something like this than me or maybe you. There are wiser, more talented, funnier, more beautiful, younger, smarter, richer, better... What was I saying? There are a lot of drag queens better at this than me, but drag needs a union because of stories like Stacey Lane Matthews's. Stacey Lane Matthews was one of the original queens to appear on Drag Race. During her run on season three, she was beloved and created memes and catchphrases that are still in use on the show today. Drag Race and every season and iteration of the show that has followed is partially due to what queens like Stacey did to establish that early formula. Stacey also won the show's Snatch Game, which is a fact that is often forgotten, and the show even dedicated an entire episode of All Stars 4 to her legacy. One of my all-time favorite queens in Drag Race history. I'm talking the original Henny. Henny. <laughs> That's right. From Back Swamp, North Carolina, please welcome yeah! Stacey Lane Matthews. Yeah! The Henny. Like the mother Henny. Oh my gosh, a legend. Wow. Today, Stacey Lane Matthews has spent time struggling with homelessness and has taken to asking for donations from fans online. The establishment should be ashamed of that. Like many nightlife professionals and theatrical performers, the COVID-19 pandemic hit Stacey's drag career pretty hard overnight for long enough to do it permanent damage. I myself have only recently started performing live again years into the pandemic, but some of us didn't have other ways of making a living. And Stacy is suffering from medical conditions and injuries after a car accident that she was not at fault for, not that it matters. And after a lifetime of doing physically demanding jobs like delivering for DoorDash or drag. If Stacy isn't able to meaningfully create drag right now, the industry doesn't really have a way to use her and therefore they don't really care about her. So what's gonna happen to her? Paramount doesn't have a plan for Stacy. HBO and AMC don't have any plans for the queens who cycle through their systems. For some, being forever defined by it. Even when Stacey had rent money, she was unable to find a landlord that would rent to her due to her lack of a, quote, real job with a fixed income, which caused her to have to canvas fans once again to find someone to rent her an apartment. Sickness and age and mental illness can and will happen to every single queen that you see appear on television. 
Every American deserves health care and a warm meal and a place to sleep, but as drag queens, we are not equipped to get that for every American. But we can get it for ourselves. Right now. Stacey Lane Matthews is both a preview of the coming reality for a lot of drag performers and very much a real person in a real crisis right now. So while I've been joking a lot about you supporting my Patreon, because I am actually very poor and very much need money right now, <laughs> but if you've only got a few dollars to spend, you should definitely give it to Stacey Lane Matthews. Artists like her are the reason I can even do this today. Her payment information should be on your screen now and in the description. But beyond one-off donations, artists like Stacey need a permanent solution. Unions make their members more money, and those members can financially support their union with a tiny slice of those extra profits, which means that as long as drag exists, a drag union couldn't go bankrupt. Unions are powerful because, unlike businesses, even drag-owned businesses, you can't be fired from them. They can't be bought out, and their interests are whatever your interests are. SAG-AFTRA and GLAAD have practically moved mountains around the Hollywood sign, and I will always be a fan of their many accomplishments. But we need organizations specifically focused on us and our issues. We are too unique. We are too big a target. We are too big an industry. With everything changing in the world, especially with the coming rise of AI-generated content, we don't really have the luxury to wait a moment longer to consolidate and exercise our power as a community of artists. Actors did it in 1933. We can certainly do it in 2023. It's time. The best thing about the drag community is also the best thing about the LGBTQIA community as a whole. That we come from every walk of life. Progress has been made on queer rights because queer people come out of the woodwork of every facet of society with one thing in common, that we're queer. We are united by the fact that we have had to drop our shame to join this community. We set aside our differences during the AIDS crisis and together we beat back that disease to nearly defeat in just a few short years. But now it is time for us to beat back the poverty and exploitation of our own artists in our own art form. We as a community are uniquely positioned with a representative in every state, every city, every business, and every family. And because of that, we can't be ignored. Drag has been created and powered by the most effective community for change in the modern world. And we can do more. Maybe the economics of drag will never make sense, but they can make a lot more sense than they do right now. The fist certainly has one meaning to people who do drag, and it's an important one. But may I introduce a second? If you liked the video, please subscribe to check out my Patreon because I am, as I said, very broke. And videos like this take a long time to make and that's usually not what the algorithm prefers. I know this is my first video, but if you'd like to give me a chance, your support means that I can get those stories right and maybe take the time to make things look a little nicer. Also, if you haven't yet, jump down to the comment section and tell me what you think about everything I've said today. And also let me know any other topics you'd want me to look into. Would you like an expose on The Real Housewives? Because I have one. Speaking of, you can also watch this video I did a few years ago, Out of Drag, about Tyler Henry, or listen to my podcast about financial scams over on The Financial Diet. If you'd like to follow me elsewhere on the internet, you're an adult and you know how to do that, but there are some links in the description. And if you're in Georgia, please go see The Lady Chablis, because you will not regret that. If you're still curious about the topic, you can also check out the description of this video to find out what else you can watch or read to learn more. Please. One of my tits is always trying to leave.